Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends of EPC and colleagues, it's a great pleasure to have you joining uh, our webinar today on the much awaited major piece of legislation, the Digital Services Act. I am uh, Andreas Saktudianakis, policy analyst at the EPC, responsible for the digital policy agenda with uh, our partners from the University of Tilburg, Professor India de Graaf, and uh, the University of uh, Namur, Professor Alexander de Stiel, as well as the generous funders of uh, this project, the Open Society Foundations, uh, Omidia Network, and the King uh, Badouin Foundation. From all of us, it's, it's a big welcome to you and a big thanks uh, for joining us here today. Um, the Digital Clearinghouse has been one of the flagship projects at the European Policy Center, launched in uh, 2016. The D Digital Clearinghouse aims to create a platform facilitating cooperation, dialogue, and exchange of insights and best practices between uh, regulatory authorities, policymakers, researchers, and other stakeholders. Um, so it's, it's great to have you all here and uh, with uh, such a renowned uh, panel of experts. And uh, uh, without further delay, I would like to give the floor to uh, Inge de Graaf, who is from the University of Tilburg and is going uh, to moderate uh, our discussion today. So Inge, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Andreas, and uh, also welcome uh, from my side to all of you. Uh, as the moderator of uh, today's event, I very much look forward to uh, our discussion because we have an excellent panel of speakers. Uh, before we start the panel, I would like to uh, share um, a few um, thoughts with you as a background to uh, today's panel. So in the past um, two years uh, with the Digital Clearinghouse, we have organized a number of roundtables uh, for regulators where we discussed issues like um, the regulation of non-monetary price markets, the governance of data sharing, and also how to regulate market power in the di digital era. Uh, you can find more information about those roundtables and also the background notes uh, that we prepared with the University of universities of uh, Namur and Tilburg on our website, if you are interested. And uh, actually, while organizing these uh, roundtables, a few general insights kept coming back throughout the various topics that we covered. And I will share some of those insights with you now, as they may be helpful as a framing for our debate. So one uh, general insight is um, that we see an increasing intersection between fields where sometimes tensions may arise, but also where uh, regulatory frameworks uh, may complement and strengthen each other's. There are overlaps and synergies that can be achieved in this regard. And uh, this is an issue that is well known by now, uh, but there are also still open questions about how to best take advantage of those synergies in practice in concrete cases. Another more um, general insight that kept coming up is that um, although uh, many of these regimes uh, are quite flexible and leave room for interpretation to address new market developments and novel types of concerns, sometimes this really requires experimentation by regulatory authorities to develop new approaches for effective enforcement. And this could also imply that there may be a need to create clarity in new legislation and maybe even lay down additional requirements in relation to some issues in order to be able to take more effective action. And this is actually what we see happening uh, now. After publication of various reports around the world about the challenges of uh, digitization for competition and regulation, um, the process of reform and also adoption of new regulatory measures has now uh, started. The EU, as you all know, is uh, preparing a Digital Services Act, which uh, among others would uh, include ex ante regulation for what is called gatekeeping platforms. The public consultation of the European Commission has uh, just ended last week. And there's also developments at the national level. An amendment to the German Competition Act is on the table, which would um, expand the powers of the Bundeskartellamt. 
And in the UK, uh, the Competition and Markets Authority recently recommended the government to establish a new pro-competitive regime. And we will hear about many of these topics probably in today's panel. And part of these new actions would uh, lead to additional requirements for especially strong players, introducing asymmetric regulation because it would impose stricter conditions on players that have greater market power. And this refers back to the title of uh, today's event. An important consideration for designing such new regulatory measures is what lessons we can draw from earlier enforcement actions. And this is actually where you see policy making and enforcement meeting. And this is also why we decided to organize a panel about this topic under the umbrella of uh, the Digital Clearinghouse. So we are very happy to, to have some of the key actors in this process with us uh, today. So now moving on uh, to the panel. So how uh, we will run the panel is that each of the three speakers will first make some introductory remarks. And then we will have a discussion where there is also a possibility for you as the audience to ask questions. So let me um, introduce our first speaker. Alex Agu Saliba is a member of uh, the European Parliament from the Socialists and Democrats group. He sits in the Parliament's IMCO committee, the Committee for Internal Market and Consumer Protection, where uh, he is the rapporteur for the Digital Ser uh, Services Act. And in that position, he actually finds himself in the middle of all the action, being in charge of this very influential piece of legislation. So Alex, thank you for uh, joining us uh, today. To start off um, our discussion, could you share with us uh, some insights on the work that you and the parliament are doing in this area and what we can expect from the DSA in terms of scope and approach? So first of all, I would like to thank the Digital Clearing Clearinghouse for organizing this very timely debate, um, this very timely discussion that we have today on the on the DSA. Right now it's a very active time for the European Parliament when it comes to um, the three different reports that are being undertaken by three different committees. My report, the own legislative initiative being undertaken by the Internal Market Committee, whereby we are taking um, an approach to tackle particularly two important issues, um, the revision of the e-commerce directive and also the Exante um, internal market instrument, which I we will be discussing um, uh, today. But there are two other committees, uh, the Euro Committee and the uh, Libra Committee, who have also another two reports touching upon other uh, elements uh, concerning digital digital services. Uh, as we all know, today we are living in a digital world where online platforms are increasingly playing a central role both in the social and economic life of our people, of our citizens. Platform economy is basically becoming a key instrument in bringing people and also business together. They help facilitate social and also commercial exchanges of goods, services and also information which otherwise would not have happened. Consumers and businesses have embraced the surge of the platform economy and they are trying to make the best out of it. And the importance of platform economy, the importance of e-commerce was also heavily witnessed during the lockdown period, during the COVID crisis, whereby it was an instrument which basically continued um, to help us live our life as normally as possible. Platforms, however, have also raised uh, new policy, new regulatory challenges, which need and should be addressed in the DSA package. The meteoric growth of the big tech giants has rightly so caused concerns about market dominance and also the widening information and power asymmetry between platforms and also citizens, businesses, and also regulators alike. The e-commerce directive has been basically one of the cornerstones of the internet for a long time. Many of its provisions still work perfectly until this very day. 
However, 20 years ago, the digital economy was very different from nowadays. And some of these provisions need either rethinking or reevaluating so that they can be fit for the time that we are living in today. When the e-commerce directive was adopted, platforms like Google, like Amazon, like Booking.com were in their infancies. Many other intermediaries did not even exist at the time. Over the past 20 years, the businesses models of some of these and other companies have continued to change. The power dynamics has, have also continued to change. Today, some of the markets are characterized by large platforms with significant networking effects, which are able to basically act de facto as online gatekeepers of the digital economy. Fair and effective competition between online platforms, operators and providers with significant digital presence and other providers is key for these markets. Further, the European digital market landscape has also experienced datafication, a multiplication of platforms, a proliferation of the collaborative economy, and also a diversification of service providers in terms of functions, in terms of vertical integration, also in terms of size. The platform economy has largely evolved and legislators definitely need to catch up as soon as possible. After the US Congress grilled the big tech companies, big tech CEOs, uh, in July, the expectations to regulate digital platforms such as Amazon, such as Google, such as Facebook, and the Digital Services Act are understandably high. A European solution will shift. It will shift the current position from one of the main players to the position of global digital leader, setting up rules and international standards in the digital economy. We have the possibility to become the digital leading force and we should embrace this opportunity, this opportunity that we have in front of us, be ambitious uh, and make the most out of it. We need to regulate big platforms and fix those market imbalances that we are facing today and I therefore fully support the Commission, the Commission's intention to introduce as part of the Future Digital Services Act a targeted ex ante regulation to tackle systemic issue, issues that we have, which are specific to digital markets, as well as also a tool to prevent market tipping. And that is what we have tried to address basically in our report in the last part of the report basically. Reducing barriers to market entry and by providing a framework to deal with large platforms that play a gatekeeper role in a given market, ex ante regulatory remedies have the potential to open up our markets to new entrants, including also giving a fairer opportunity to SMEs to be more competitive and also to our startups and micro enterprises, thereby also promoting directly consumer choice, a wider consumer choice, and also driving innovation beyond what can be achieved by traditional competition law by itself. The Commission should clearly define systemic operators by establishing, and this is what we are suggesting basically in, in, in our report, it should set up clear economic indicators that basically would allow regulatory authorities to identify those platforms which enjoy significant market positions and also which have a gatekeeper role, thereby play, playing a strategic role when it comes to the online economy. Such indicators, and these are fair, uh, clearly listed also in our report, uh, should include considerations, for example, as whether the undertaking is active to a significant extent on multi-sided markets or has the ability to lock in users and also consumers. The size of its network, although we don't agree uh, with, 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 with the idea of only uh, evaluating and defining systemic operators upon size, but we believe that size uh, or, uh, and also size should be one of these indicators and also the presence of networking effects amongst also other elements that should be, should be assessed. 
the ex-ante regulation should also be built upon the platform to business regulation and also other measures should ensure fair trading conditions on all actors on all platforms including possible also additional requirements and a closed list of the positive and negative actions that such operators are required required to comply with and are also forbidden to engage in i think it is important to look also at the profit making motives of global tech giants including facebook google apple and amazon and it is also time to ask a number of questions on uh, anti competitive practices content moderation and also the mass harvesting of user data which definitely is diluting uh, consumer user confidence in such systems harvesting of data and also the use of data from one market to expand it, your influence into another by systemic operators as well as the possibility or obligation um, to use one e-identification designed by one service provider for several platforms is creating a lot of imbalances in the bargaining power increased transparency is also key and this is also a key element that we are highlighting throughout our report not only for uh, platforms having a systemic role but basically for the whole ecosystem but we are focusing when it comes to issues of, of transparency focusing more also on, on platforms which have a systemic systemic role furthermore the new rules should also look into the lack of interoperability uh, and also appropriate tools data expertise resources deployed by systemic uh, platform operators to allow customers basically to switch or to connect and to interoperate between digital platforms or internet ecosystems the commission should also look into practices of platforms of displaying basically their own downstream services more prominently than those of their rivals or data uh, envelopment used to expand market power in one market or in adjacent markets uh, incurring in, in self-preferencing practices of their own products and services and engaging in practices aimed at locking in consumers the list is never ending however what is also important and this and with this i want to conclude my intervention is that the new ex ante regulations should be complementary to traditional complement to traditional competition policy therefore we are calling them also as uh, new internal market tools thank you thank you very much for that very uh, helpful overview of all the issues that um, the dsa is expected to address i think this reminds us again of really the the breadth of um, uh, topics that uh, that we expect to see and also the complexity of the topic where um, a good balance needs to be found between addressing some of the concerns we see while also at the same time making sure uh, we can reap the benefits uh, of what platforms can offer us in Europe uh, both for businesses and also for consumers. Um, so next to, to everything that is happening now um, uh, at the EU level uh, we also see uh, national governments and national competition authorities becoming increasingly active. And uh, the German competition authority, the Bundeskartellamt, is one of those very uh, proactive national competition authorities who really keep developing uh, the field. And probably the most uh, well-known enforcement action of the Bundeskartellamt in uh, the past years is uh, the in investigation into Facebook's practices, where, as many of you know, uh, Facebook was found liable for abusing its dominance by imposing um, unfair conditions on users that uh, violated also the data protection rules. And this decision uh, was recently upheld by uh, the German Federal Court of Justice in interim proceedings. Another example, um, just to give you a bit of an idea, is um, how the Bundeskartellamt uh, managed um, to get an improvement in the terms for, uh, of business for sellers um, from Amazon in summer 2019. So these are some examples where you can really see the pioneering work 
of uh, the Bundeskartellamt in uh, the digital sphere. So we are very happy uh, to have uh, President Andreas Mund on uh, the panel with us uh, today. So Andreas, happy to, uh, to give you the floor now and to hear uh, what your thoughts are on uh, the challenges of current enforcement and also the efforts that the Bundeskartellamt has been doing in this regard. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Inge, and thank you for having me. It's a great honor and a pleasure uh, to be on this panel uh, today. What I would like to do is just to take a very short analysis uh, of, of the current situation in digital markets. And I would like to show a little bit uh, a lot um, that people accept, expect from, from the enforcement of the Digital Services Act as far as competition law is concerned, is already in place. Uh, it's not like there haven't been any cases. And um, my, my, my second part of my remarks will, will concern regulation and how you can do regulation in the area of the digital economy, because I think this is not an easy task. So to start with a short analysis, I think there are no doubts uh, how many benefits digitalization has brought for consumers, uh, for the whole uh, society lots of convenient services and, and improvements. Uh, the current situation under COVID-19 is boosting that even uh, to a large extent. So I think it's fair to say that digitalization has changed, um, uh, has changed our, our way of life and work and uh, we must give it a, a framework. And I think this is what, what uh, matters now. Of course, it has also changed the work for us as competition agencies. I think in this situation, we have two tasks. Uh, one is uh, preventing companies from foreclosing markets. And the second one is uh, preventing companies from harm, doing harm to consumers, uh, which is especially true for so-called gatekeepers uh, that, that, we all, that we all know. We know the effects, how it comes to the um, winner takes it all uh, phenomenon. There are network effects in place, users attract users, uh, again they attract users, um, uh, users attract uh, providers, uh, providers attract users. Uh, that is one, one explanation why we see this, um, well, this kind of dominance in the digital economy. Uh, the other one is that many gatekeepers uh, have um, strongly uh, data-driven business models uh, and data uh, contributes significantly to dominance and it can create high barriers to entry for those companies who do not have the same uh, data. And this again is reinforcing network effect. So we have similar phenomena that go hand in hand and that lead to the dominance uh, in this area. Uh, as I said, COVID-19 uh, has boosted this situation to a certain extent. Uh, everyone talks about crisis. Um, certain companies only talk about the benefits um, of, of the crisis. Uh, if you look at, at Amazon, Amazon has doubled its, its quarterly profits in the second quarter of uh, 2020 compared to 2019. Um, we might see a similar development in the area of online advertising uh, we have seen some cuts of budget for advertising and we can assume uh, that lots of this uh, left budget goes into online and advertising now and we can also assume that it goes to the big ones uh, due to the fact uh, that they, they catch the broadest attention and they are very successful, have a very successful and attractive um, billing scheme uh, on a cost per click basis. So this is what explains the situation that we are in to a certain extent. Um, we as competition agencies, we have gathered, gathered a lot of experience with the digital economy. Uh, there have been large cases over the last year. You, you mentioned some of them already. In a, uh, one, one case was uh, the Bundeskartellamt case back in 2013 when we prohibited a price parity clauses to Amazon vis-a-vis uh, -vis those dealers that are dealing with the, the, the Amazon marketplace. Um, we achieved, uh, in, in, in my perspective, a uh, huge improvement for dealers on the Amazon marketplace also back in 2019 and not only for Germany but uh, worldwide. 
Um, we, we, we achieved um, uh, advantages uh, for hotels uh, when we prohibited at least the white parity, price parity clause um, on uh, online hotel booking platforms. And you already mentioned uh, the recent decision by the Federal Supreme Court on our Facebook case, uh, where the court confirmed that Facebook has abused its market power by collecting user data also off Facebook. So there is a lot going on already, and not only with regard to conceptual groundwork, but with regard to real enforcement. And I think in some cases, even enforcement that hurts companies and that really goes to the root of their dominance. Uh, it is well known that I think the Facebook case is one of these cases where we really go to the root, the fundament of uh, the dominance of Facebook. So what is the path forward in this, uh, in this situation? One huge, problem, one huge problem, of course, is uh, that it's very difficult to do timely uh, interventions. And I think uh, there's a strong feeling around the globe that competition agencies should be able to act uh, before irreparable harm to the market has occurred. Sometimes we find quick solutions. In the last case we did with Amazon, we came to an agreement uh, with that company uh, within eight months time. That is pretty, pretty fast, I assume. But of course, it is clear that there is kind of a natural tension um, between speedy proceedings on the one side and thorough legal and economic assessment on the other side. So, what has to happen? Many, many talk about ex ante regulation now, and I, I want to go a little bit into that. Where are, what, what are the difficulties about uh, regulation? Well, it starts with a crucial question, what kind and, and in what sort do we want uh, to regulate? It has its own challenges. By intuition, we look into regulation of branches. Um, of industries like telecommunication and electricity. But of course, that cannot be compared because that is about infrastructure, the sharing of infrastructure. Infrastructure is coherent, it is static. But the companies we're talking about, they are everything but that. They are not coherent, they are not uh, static. Um, they have different business models. They have completely different strategies. The markets are highly dynamic. So when we talk about regulation, we do not talk about regulating a sector. We talk about regulation of a single company because every regulation of every company, since they have different business models, different strategies has to be different. Uh, in a way. So we have to answer the first question that is um, who shall be regulated? Do we take a broad uh, approach? Do we regulate a variety of companies? Do we take a sector driven approach like the P2B regulation where you find around about 10,000 platforms active in Europe that are regulated? Well, if you do this, this has some very important implications because with a, a broad variety of companies covered, um, regulation needs to be less intense because you want to avoid over-regulation, of course. I mean, we do not want to regulate those who want to be competitors of those that are incumbents uh, today. So that is, that is difficult to say, that is a difficult, strategy. Um, then we might make use of option two, which means we have an asymmetric regulation in the future targeting only the selected few. So that would allow for more precise and more or stronger interventions. But who should be the happy few? How do you define those who should be regulated? The, the, the P2B regulation um, illustrates uh, that complexity very well because during the legislative process it was proposed to go beyond a light touch approach only with transparency obligations 
towards a far-reaching substantive rule of fairness uh, in there. But that would have applied to thousands of small platforms, including small and maybe promising European startups whom we want to be a competitor of the incumbents. I'm, I'm just saying this to, to, to say how complex regulation is in this, uh, in this uh, situation and that um, any legislative process have to deal with these questions. So if you look at the Digital Services uh, Act now, it proposes an ex ante regulatory instrument, still relatively abstract, uh, but we could look at it in the way we have it before our eyes. So also the DSA pleads for a set of clear criteria to identify addressees. That sounds good. Um, very welcome. That provides uh, legal certainness. But how do, do, how do you define very clearly, again, those who shall be uh, addressed? Is it the, the size of the user base? And if you take the size of the user base, what is the, 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 what is the metric? Is it the registered user? Is it the daily active user? Is it the monthly active user? What about the unique user uh, plus a large user base does not necessarily mean that this coincides with a strong position in the market. That can be the case, but doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So that speaks in favor of including further criteria like network effects, like having a gatekeeper position. But if you do that, you are pretty fast, again, in a case-by-case -case assessment, which is not meant by ex ante regulation. The second question is, which kind of behavior do you want to address? Um, we know from economics and from experience uh, that competitive effects can be ambivalent, in particular in the digital uh, economy. I'm, I'm very skeptical that it is easy to define a clear set of behavior that you can regulate ex ante. Um, think about self-preference. I think we all agree, or most, most agencies, most economists agree, that self-preference is something that can be addressed under competition law and that especially in, in the case of hybrid platforms can use can lead to an abuse. But how do you identify self-preference? And here, remember the Google case. In the Google case, there was an, a never-ending story about the colors and the shade of the colors on the screen that might lead to self-preference or not. So self-preference is far from being clear when it comes to the precise behavior that you have before your eyes and that you have to assess. Last point um, I, I would like to make also with regard uh, to the development in, in Germany. Uh, there are many, many initiatives going on. I mean, there's a Digital Services Act. Uh, there is also the new competition tool uh, that is driven forward by, by uh, GDCom. To me, it is not quite clear yet what is the relation between the new competition tool and the Digital uh, Services Act. And we should have in mind that besides this, we still have Article 102 TFEU in place. That is also important um, and that remains European primary law. So what about the companies that are covered by the Digital Services Act and that are subject to enforcement? Are they at the same time subject to enforcement through the new competition tool and at the same time through article one or two. Is the behavior that is um, prohibited the same under the Digital Services Act, the new competition tool, article 102? So I have the impression that there are quite some things that are not clear yet, but I'm deeply convinced that what we certainly do not need is uh, uh, unclear competencies and lengthy coordination procedures between various parts of the Commission or in the national competition agencies. The way we go forward in Germany is a bit different, and this is my last point. Uh, we also go for some regulation, 
or you can call it competition law plus. I mean, it might be both. But what we do, what we intend here in Germany is always in the spirit and in the context of competition law. So in the amendment, the uh, German Competition Act addresses abusive conduct of undertakings with paramount significance for competition across markets. Uh, but mind you, a, a little bit um, of, the, uh, of the approach uh, that the CMA has taken uh, in the UK uh, when they talk about platforms uh, with a strategic market status. That is not so far, far apart. So when we define this paramount significance for competition uh, across markets, we would consider inter alia vertical integration, the role as a gatekeeper, all these kind of issues. And on this basis, we would prohibit certain kinds of conduct, like again, self-preferencing, envelopment strategies, uh, establishing barriers, uh, entry barriers related to data, hindering interoperability or data uh, portability. Important is that the way as we would do it in the future would mean that we could also prohibit a certain behavior to the identified companies on markets where they are not dominant yet. And this is the regulatory part of it. But we would do it on a case by case basis. We would have to identify certain companies and then prohibit a certain behavior. But again, if I look at the Digital Services Act, if I look at the new competition tool, I have the impression that this case-by-case -case approach is necessary in order not to regulate the competitors of the incumbents whom we, re whom we really want to, um, uh, well, to give up some of their dominance. Regulation for both cannot be the same. So in a way, I think we need some uh, asymmetric regulation. And then again, we are always in an assessment on a case-by-case -case basis, which we might, we might improve by defining uh, certain per se, um, uh, per se uh, strategies, uh, but it will remain a case-by-case -case assessment from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, insightful comments. Indeed, this reminds us that if we look back at some of these um, uh, enforcement actions that have already taken place by competition authorities, you can actually see that some of them have been quite uh, successful and indeed that uh, designing new regulation would create its own difficulties, uh, finding a proper uh, scope in terms of the addressees and indeed also trying to um, uh, find the type of behavior that we would uh, uh, be capturing. So this raises the question of how um, we could complement our existing regimes like competition law with new uh, regulation. And this is also a question that comes up um, in the um, a market study that uh, has been conducted by the Competition and Markets Authority in, uh, in the UK. And this was a market investigation into online platforms and digital uh, advertising where uh, the outcome was published this uh, July in the form of a, a final report with many uh, detailed annexes uh, with a lot of, of new information and new uh, insights where um, the overall conclusion of the CMA was that um, competition is not working well uh, in, in these markets, which can lead to harm for consumers, but also for uh, society as a whole. And um, the key recommendation of the CMA to the UK government is to establish a new pro-competition regulatory uh, regime. And uh, with us today is uh, Simeon Thornton, who is a director at the UK CMA and who is responsible for carrying out market studies. And in that capacity, he uh, has also been leading the market study into online platforms and uh, digital advertising. So Simeon, um, thank you for, uh, for joining us today and congratulations to, uh, to you and uh, your team for this impressive uh, piece of work. Could you take us uh, through some of the findings of the CMA and some of the recommendations that you made uh, for future action? Indeed. Thank you, Inga, and thank you also to the Digital Clearinghouse for organising this um, fascinating panel discussion. Um, as Inga said, I am director at the CMA and I led the recent study into online platforms and digital advertising 
Um, final report was published in July, so just a couple of months ago, and we did make um, this high-level recommendation for a new pro-competition uh, regulatory regime to govern the behaviour of, of online platforms with significant market power. And it strikes me there are quite strong parallels, actually, between what we recommended in the study and the direction of travel that the Commission uh, appears to be following in the consultation on the Digital Services Act. So I thought it would be helpful maybe to set out how we reached the conclusions that we reached that reform was necessary and also to set out the broad um, outline of the reforms that we are recommending. It is a very uh, long report in total with all the appendices, it's almost 2,000 pages. Um, so I'm just going to touch on the surface and obviously if there are particular issues that people are interested in, really happy to, to engage with those in the Q&A afterwards. Um, first thing I should say is this was a study into platforms funded by digital advertising. So we did focus on Google and Facebook in particular. The CMA is doing follow-up work on, through the Digital Markets Task Force on the broader range of online platforms, but the comments I'll be making relate specifically to platforms funded by digital advertising. We structured our work through key, three key analytical questions, and the first of which was to what extent do Google and Facebook have um, market power in um, search and, and um, social media respectively, and what are the sources of that market power? The second question is to what extent are users able to have adequate control over the data that they provide to those platforms? And the third question, focusing on the market in which that attention and data is monetized, the digital advertising market, was to what extent um, problems such as a lack of transparency, market power, and conflicts of interest undermine effective competition in digital advertising markets. So those are our three questions. Before I give you our answer to those questions, um, you know, we, we use the market study tool in the UK. Um, we have strong information gathering powers. And I think a large part of our work and our objectives was to inform the public debate about how these markets work. So I wanted to give a few facts and figures before I went into the details. Um, the digital advertising market is very big in the UK. In 2019, it was 14 billion pounds. Um, search is over half of that, so over £7 billion, and Google, perhaps unsurprisingly, has a very strong share of search and search advertising, over 90%. We were able to do a bit of, I think, what was path-breaking work to compare the advertising prices of Google and Bing on a like-for-like -like basis, and that involved a, a lot of work and gathering a lot of data. But we calculated that Google charges around 30 to 40% more uh, on a like for like basis than Bing. In terms of display advertising, um, Facebook has a very large share of that. It's over five billion pounds in the UK. Facebook's got over 50% of that. And um, Facebook's average revenue per user has increased very rapidly over the last few years from under five pounds in 2011 to over 50 pounds in 2019. So these are big markets and both Google and Facebook are generating large amounts of revenue. We looked at their profitability and it is way in excess of any of the normal benchmarks. Now you might say, so far, so unsurprising. We all knew that Google and Facebook were large and successful companies. I think probably more relevant to this discussion today as to why we need reform, we also identified a number of features of the markets within which Google and Facebook operate that effectively insulate them from full effective competition. And we frame these as barriers to entry and expansion. And a large part of our work was trying to detail how those barriers to entry and expansion worked. We identified six high level barriers to entry and expansion. I just wanted to go through those at a very high level. The first is, um, I think this was a point that Andreas uh, picked up in his comments. The first was um, network effects and economies of scale. So to take Google's position, for example, in relation to search, Google has many more users in the UK and indeed globally than the nearest rival, which is Bing. And that means it has access to a lot more click and query data. That data is incredibly useful in training algorithms to provide relevant search results. So there's an extent to which having been big in the past insulates you from competition and means you can continue to be big and successful in the future. In relation to um, Facebook, Clearly, as a social network, it benefits substantially from network effects. Um, we found that 
yes, there have been a number of uh, new entrants into the social media market in recent years. And while those new entrants have had significant numbers of downloads in terms of the time spent on the platforms, they haven't really eroded um, Facebook's market position. So that's the first one, network effects uh, and economies of scale. Second major factor that we identified was consumer behavior and the power of defaults. Now, a really surprising thing that we found when we did the study was that Google, you know, a company whose name is synonymous with internet search, still finds it appropriate to spend a lot of money to um, operators of uh, mobile devices, including in particular Apple, to be the default search engine on those mobile devices. Um, it spends uh, over a billion pounds in the UK alone on being the default search engine. That's over 17% of, it of its revenues. And that I think is a very stark illustration of the fact that even when you've got a very strong brand and a very strong product, product like Google, being the default option is extremely powerful because it drives consumer behavior. And we see an analogous piece of a behavior in terms of um, Facebook and the choices or choice architecture that it imposes on consumers in terms of giving up access to their data. Um, we looked at the way in which Facebook frames those choices and other social media and platforms. We found that with one or two exceptions, they don't provide any choice at all to, to consumers over whether to provide access um, to their data for personalized advertising purposes. Um, and we found that where choices are available, they're framed in such a way as to um, encourage consumers to act in a way that is consistent with the platform's interests. So the use of defaults and choice architecture, another really important feature of these markets. Third feature is about unequal access to user data. Now in digital advertising markets in particular, user data is really useful. It's really useful for targeting advertising. That's particularly the case in display advertising. It's also useful for what's called attribution, which is working out whether your advert had an effect in practice. And both Google and Facebook have very, very large amounts of user data that they gather through their consumer facing services. They gather in the case of Google through its um, ownership of browsers and um, mobile devices. Um, and they also both gather through um, analytical products put on third party platforms, which for Google are called tags um, and for Facebook are called pixels. And in effect, the fact that these companies have such huge, uh, huge volumes of user data allows them to generate high revenue through digital advertising in a way that their rivals can't match. Um, a fourth factor that I wanted to highlight concerns a lack of transparency. Um, this is a really important feature of these markets. Uh, by necessity, a lot of decisions in these markets are made by black box algorithms. They involve looking at huge amounts of data and making decisions in real time. Now, those algorithms are absolutely necessary for the functioning of these real time markets, but they are very difficult for third parties to interrogate, to understand. And that gives the operators of those algorithms a lot of power. Uh, and we found in digital advertising markets in particular, that both Google and Facebook have surprising amounts of power over what their advertisers choose to do. So for example, just to take one example in relation to Facebook, over 90% of Facebook's users in the UK use the default um, automated bidding, bidding option, which effectively gives Facebook the ability not only to decide in which auction you're going to bid, but also the level of your bid itself. So there really is very, very extreme amounts of asymmetric information in these markets. Um, the penultimate issue I wanted to identify is the, the importance, the growing importance of ecosystems. So these are products and services that grow organically around the core product or service that the platform provides. We acknowledge very, very frankly in the report that having these ecosystems can have benefits for consumers. It means that you can access a range of products and services seamlessly, can reduce costs, but it can also increase uh, competition problems. It gives the platforms the ability to leverage market power in a core product or service in order to undermine competition in an adjacent market. Um, and that is one of the key things that we, we, we've taken into account in our design of remedies. And then the final feature that I wanted to, to highlight, and I do realize I'm going through these very briefly, is um, the sort of problem of conflicts of interest that can arise through vertical integration and other forms of integration. 
A uh, particular case that we highlighted in the report concerns Google's role as what's called a publisher ad server. Now this is a kind of technological piece of kit, but essentially Google has more than 90% of the share of the ad server market. It is the product that um, publishers and other content providers use um, to determine which ad is going to be served in real time and what price is going to be paid. It's an important part, a very important part of the ecosystem. And we found that Google, by dint of having a strong role in relation to this function, often finds that it's operating on multiple sides of a transaction. It might be representing publishers, advertisers, acting on its own behalf and does face um, potentially very strong conflicts of interest. So taking a step back, and there is a lot of detail in the report, um, why do these problems mean that we need a change of regime? Well, I think the first point I would make is that um, these barriers to entry and expansion um, are self-reinforcing. That means that it's not sufficient to tackle one, you have to tackle multiple barriers to entry and expansion simultaneously. And the tools that we have, powerful though they, though they are, do tend to focus on, on one issue in isolation. And that is why we concluded that really you need a tool that allows you to, to engage with these issues and challenges on multiple fronts. Second consideration is the fact that competition in these markets can change very rapidly. And because of their gatekeeper function, these platforms have the ability to change or undermine competition very rapidly. And that means that you need a tool that can act quickly. Um, we all know about you know, recent cases involving Google at the European Commission level. Those took multiple years to prosecute and clearly given the fast moving nature of some of these markets, that is too slow. So we need a form of intervention that's quicker. The, the other thing I would say is that the markets do evolve and the, particularly the technological underpinnings of those markets evolve. And that means that when you put a remedy in place, you want the ability to amend that remedy, to revise it, to, to ensure that it's still fit for purpose in a few years time. And that requires an ongoing regulatory oversight, again, rather than the sort of one-off interventions that you see typically in the competition sphere. I think the last point I wanted to make is that, you know, for the platforms themselves, I think a large part of the benefit of an ex-ante regime is greater clarity. Um, it is important that platforms understand the dividing line between right and wrong and the participants, the, the users of those platforms understand it. And we think that that is one of the key benefits of a new regulatory regime. Um, in essence, what we recommended uh, has two components. We recommended um, a code of conduct for platforms with strategic market status. And we recommended that um, the regulatory authority put in place to implement that code should also be able to use a range of what we call pro-competition interventions. Um, these two aspects of the regulatory regime have rather different objectives. So the object of the code is to govern the behavior of platforms with significant market power, to try to mitigate the effects of that market power and to protect competition and consumers. In contrast, the um, objectives of the pro-competition interventions are to tackle the sources of market power, to try to increase competition um, and um, allow new entrants to thrive and grow. Now, in that sense, I think there is an analogy between these two elements of what we have recommended and what is in the consultation document over the Digital Services Act. The pro-competition interventions in particular are similar, as I understand it, to the tailor-made uh, remedies that the Commission discusses. Um, just a little bit more about how those two elements might work, and then I will stop and we can open it up to discussion. Um, we, in setting out the need for a code, I think we were clear that it should apply to platforms with um, uh, market power and a strong gatekeeper function. Um, the phrase used to encapsulate those two concepts in the Furman Review was strategic market status, and that was the the phrase that we used in the report. Um, we are doing further work in the CMA to develop thinking on how strategic market status might be defined, but we were very clear on the basis of the extensive work that we had done in our market study that against any re reasonable definition of strong market power and an important gatekeeper function, both Google and Facebook would be caught by those provisions. 
we thought that the code should be based around principles rather than very prescriptive rules. And that is because given the fast moving nature of these markets, if you had very prescriptive rules in the code, it might become redundant quickly. But we recognize that greater clarity is an important contribution that we want this regulatory regime to bring. So we advocated that a regulatory authority should also produce guidance to help in the interpretation of those principles. Um, and we thought that in terms of the structure of the code, it should be structured around three high level objectives. Fair trading, open choices and trust and transparency. Just to explain what we mean by those. Um, fair trading is analogous in a sense to, in competition terms, to guarding against behavior that might be considered exploitative. Open choice is about, is about guarding against behavior that might be exclusionary, whether that exclusion takes the form of contractual restrictions or failure to interoperate. And trust and transparency is about overcoming those asymmetries of information that I mentioned earlier on. So that's the code. In terms of the pro-competitive interventions, um, we set out a number of such interventions at a high level, those encompass data related interventions, such as providing access, third party access to data, or creating data silos, increasing interoperability. Um, we think that separation powers can potentially have an important role to play as well. Um, and just to give you a flavor of how we would apply those in relation to search, um, we said that there could be an important intervention to provide uh, third party search engines with access to Google's click and query data in order to overcome those barriers to entry and expansion, the economies of scale that Google benefits from. Um, so look, I, it's two o'clock now. I will stop my comments there. I could go on at greater length, but if there are any particular issues that um, you want more detail on, I'd be very happy to give it in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, those are very uh, insightful observations and also very valuable uh, insights uh, in these debates. I think how the CMA has connected um, an analysis of the features of the market with what could be adequate uh, remedies and broader interventions. Um, so having heard uh, all three speakers, now we, uh, we can move uh, to the discussion. Um, so you can um, write down your questions in, in the Q&A, please uh, do keep them as concise as possible uh, so that we can uh, address as many topics uh, as, uh, as possible before uh, we have to close this session. And in fact, we have already received uh, a few questions. So I'm going to um, bundle uh, two of them and see if uh, our panelists have any thoughts on this. And, and the, the questions relate um, to the type of regulation that is being considered. Uh, so one question is uh, whether there could be a risk that um, some of the national developments that we see in Germany, but also in France would overlap with the plans of, uh, of the EU. So I guess this, this could also be a question that could reflect on uh, whether actually the concerns we see and the different concepts that are used in, uh, in the different jurisdictions like uh, paramount significance uh, to competition across markets in Germany, the notion of strategic market status that is used in the UK, and the notion of gatekeeping platforms that uh, the European Commission is currently using, whether we can actually see those as sort of synony synonyms. So are there commonalities between those um, concepts that would uh, uh, make sure that actually the regulation that uh, could be developed has actually common concerns in mind? Or are there also indeed uh, tensions that could, could arise that we should be aware of? And, and then the second part of, uh, of uh, these reflections could um, go into um, what has been discussed in terms of trying to make a trade-off between um, regulation that is of general application and a more case-by-case -case approach, which is common in a competition law where you can really address uh, specific circumstances and do a proper legal and economic analysis. So is there a way in between that could still be uh, effective? Uh, but also be asymmetric and trying to uh, uh, address uh, the concerns that we are most uh, most worried about. And, and there is uh, also the suggestion made of could we have a personalized type of regulation. Um, so I will address uh, uh, those two questions now first uh, uh, to the panelists. Andreas, would you uh, maybe like to go first? Uh, 
Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, of course. Well, um, I think, of, of course, I, I said that already in my initial remark. Um, we must take care. We have a lot, lot, a lot of initiatives right now, not, not only at the level of the uh, Commission in, in Brussels, also at the national level. I mean, we're not the only ones in, in Europe uh, who have an amendment of the law going on. You mentioned France and what might be coming up there. The UK um, is, is not a part of the club anymore, but uh, there's also something to come, come in there. And I think we are very well advised uh, to take care that we do not have significant overlaps between all these initiatives. On the other hand, from a national perspective, I find it hard to wait now. I mean, um, the Tenth Amendment is underway. Um, it should be in place uh, by the beginning of next year because we have an obligation also uh, to put ECN plus uh, into our national law, which would mean that we would be able to act swiftly as a national competition agency and maybe make use of these new provisions um, already uh, beforehand. I mean, it is obvious that it will still take some time until we see some um, regulation, whatever it is going to be in place at the EU level. Uh, the, the, we just have the cornerstones, so to say, and even the cornerstones, uh, although very much appreciated, uh, are still quite vague, so this will take some time. Um, so this is something we need to discuss, I'm pretty sure. Um, but as I said, I also see a need to come to a, an coherent approach at the EU level with these, with these two initiatives who both have a value in themselves, um, uh, which both are appreciated, but there's still a lot of coordination to be done. Uh, that's for sure, that's for sure. Um, and uh, we will see how, how, how we will manage this. This is difficult to say, but again, German legislation and everything, if everything goes well, will be in place by the beginning of next year, which would mean that we as a, a national competition agency could take action by the beginning of next year and initiate proceedings. And uh, given the situation we are in, and given the fact there is a strong need for action, for enforcement, I think this is not so bad. Uh, with regard to, uh, well, personalized regulation, uh, however you call it, I mean, personalized, personalized regulation, at least for me to a certain extent, is again the application of individual law. And here are very close to the application, of course, of competition law. That does not mean that we should not put in place certain per se regulation. Um, I think that is not excluded, and I think that needs to be done. And I think this is not so new. I mean, if you look at the German competition law, there are per se regulations uh, as well as in European competition law, but we would impose that maybe a bit stricter to a certain extent um, on, on these uh, big, in, in, on these big in, incumbents. But we should have in mind that we, or let's put it differently, what we should really avoid is that we regulate those who should be and shall be or are potential competitors of the big incumbents we are talking about. I think that this is really important that we do not take an approach um, where one size fits all, where one size fits all 10,000 platforms that are active in Europe. So in a way, we need to do something that is customized, that is personalized, and that has a strong relationship with the company we have before our eyes and with a specific um, strategies they take to secure their dominance. Uh, Simeon has just alluded to it. Sometimes it's a bundle of strategies and you have to address them all in order to open, to open the market. But what, what one of these incumbents does must be treated differently from what a competitor does at the same time who doesn't have any dominance, who just wants to, answer, to enter the market. And 
to balance this. I think this is so difficult. I don't think we're far apart from each other. I think we all believe we need more per se rules. We need more ex ante action. The only question is how we do that, who to address, and, and how to define and how to assess what is going on. That's, that's the only difference. And um, we're, we're just at the beginning of this. But having said that, and it's my final remark, I don't think the German approach um, is, is uh, so wrong. I think it, 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 um, it, it continues uh, competition law into a new sphere. I mean, we have never ever applied abuse control to a company on a market where this company is not dominant. I mean, there's really a new approach in it, but again, still deeply rooted in competition law and the assessment of a single company and its behavior. And personally, I find it very difficult to get away from this without having chilling effects on those companies who should be competitors and whom we need to enter the market. Thank you. So indeed, with the, the new German Competition Act amendment in effect early next year, that could mean that Germany uh, is taking the lead here on trying to implement those new concepts in, uh, in concrete enforcement actions. Um, so let me now move to Alex. Would you have any thoughts on the questions posed about how do we make sure that um, these new types of regulation would really complement the existing regimes without creating tensions or any um, coordination problems? Yes, um, I think that the priority for the legislator at European level has to be one, to avoid the situation of patchwork when it comes to these uh, ex ante instruments. If we end up with a situation whereby France would have, would have its um, uh, ex ante measures, Germany would have its system with different definitions, with different concepts, we will end up with a lot of patchwork when it comes to our internal market, basically. So that's why we are focusing our attention when it comes to our report and we reiterated this point and I made it a point in the last part of my presentation that here we are not dealing with a traditional competition law instrument. Traditional competition law, although successful to a very small extent, I must say, um, was not, uh, had, did not have the right tools to create a contestable and competitive environment in the face of these um, system operators that we know today. Um, so first of all, it's really important for, for, for Europe to be a leader, a leader to do away with this patchwork. But uh, another point that is really important is that of um, focusing our attention where the problems really are. Uh, and uh, the last point, um, made um, uh, by, by, by the previous speaker on the chilling effects on those players, uh, which ultimately the intention of the legislator is that of creating a more contestable environment for them, a more competitive environment for them would be ultimately those who will face the biggest hurt this with the legislation that we will be moving forward uh, is, is, is a must be a top priority for us to do away with so it's really important for for the commission to come up with this internal market instrument based up and that is why we are we didn't move forward just two indicators one indicator to assess who has a systemic role out there in the online ecosystem in the digital ecosystem and we used a number of indicators because it, it's, it's, these indicators will be indicative and pointing um, the finger to those players who basically are um, playing a gatekeeping uh, role. So it's uh, a really uh, important balancing act that, that we have to make, but it's really important to take action and take action as a union because this is basically uh, an, a distortion of our single market and it must be tackled, and I reiterate this point, with an internal market instrument. Thank you. Yes, indeed, a very complex balancing exercise that, uh, that needs to be done. 
Simeon, would you like to, uh, to complement the comments of the previous speakers? Any thoughts on how this could work uh, in the UK with this new re regime uh, applying alongside the existing, uh, existing frameworks? So I, I think I agree with the comments that have already been made. What I would say is that there's nothing you know, unusual in large multinational companies operating according to different, re different regulatory regimes in different jurisdictions. That said, I think we have a very strong interest in trying to create consensus over the nature of the problem and coordination in terms of how to solve it. And that is for two reasons. I think there's an efficiency argument, which is that although you could have 190 odd different regulatory regimes applying to Google and Facebook, that probably wouldn't be a very efficient way to do business. But I think also there's an important argument about trying to guard against what I would call regulatory arbitrage. So if you have very, very different regulatory regimes and you see this in a lot of different walks of life, taxation regimes, et cetera, then what can happen is that one company plays off one country against another and there's a race to the bottom and a strong, powerful platform may be able to intimidate a country in terms of imposing appropriate regulations. So I think we have a strong common interest in getting a shared vision of what this new regulatory regime should look like. And what I would say is that the experience that we had in the market study, just considering some of the countries outside of Europe, we engaged strongly with Japan, Australia, with um, states at the US level, um, Mexico. And I think there really is a groundswell of opinion that we need to move in this sort of direction. And I think that's very encouraging. And we really, um, you know, we certainly don't have a monopoly on wisdom. We're very happy to listen and understand and amend our views accordingly, as well as advocating. So I think we're all on the same page there. In terms of the, the second point around, you know, personalized regulation, I think this is inevitable. I mean, you know, the, the main finding of our study was these two platforms are not like the others. They benefit from these self-reinforcing entrenched barriers to entry and expansion, and that motivates the need for action. And so it follows as a matter of logic that you want to apply a regime to them that you wouldn't apply to other platforms. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, the other part of the question was, well, can you just have sort of a priori rules or prohibitions? And I think that that would be nice and maybe possible in some contexts. But unfortunately, some of the most interesting questions that we encountered involve some sort of a trade off between a potential competition effect and, uh, you know, maybe an efficiency benefit. And so I think you are going to need to do that sort of adjudication, that weighing up process in implementing the provisions of any of these tools, which is why, as I say, we recommended that the code be framed in terms of principles with guidance to underpin it, to give a strong steer as to how the regulator will apply those principles. I still think you can do that while achieving the main objective of doing it quickly, because these tools are about changing behavior. They're about behavior change at their core, rather than imposing large fines, at least in our conception. And so I think that if you're not going through a process in which you impose a large fine at the end of the process, um, you need to reflect on the evidential standards, standards that are brought to bear in reaching a decision. And very much what we've got in mind is a flexible, nimble instrument that allows for decisions to be reached quickly rather than the current um, regime, which obviously takes many, many years to reach a conclusion. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm keeping an eye uh, on the time. I'm conscious that uh, Andreas will have to leave us in a, in a few minutes. So I would like to ask you uh, maybe one final question and also see if you have any final remarks that you would like to make. Um, there is a question posed about the possible relevance of the telecoms regime that we have in the EU because it could strike a balance between uh, setting out in regulation, for instance, some of the, uh, the requirements that could be imposed while leaving it up to authorities to actually do an analysis and implement uh, the requirements that seem uh, most fit. So would you think that this could be, this could be a, a good approach to, to take in mind? Um, and then an, another question, maybe going back a bit also to, to um, uh, the scope of uh, what could be gatekeepers or what could be the addressees of this new uh, regulation, where the point is made that all of these companies indeed, as you also stated, have different business models. Um, so is there a way um, um, to develop a number of indicators or to de develop a concept that would be uh, 
uh, a helpful way for an authority like yours to apply these new types of regulations. Would you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, thank you, Inge. Well, uh, I think what, what we need to do in the future uh, when, it, when it should come to regulation in which way ever uh, cannot probably cannot be compared to, to much that we have done before. Um, maybe one comparison, no. what we try, for example, is to draw uh, parts of the digital economy into the regulation of the telecom sector. One example is uh, messenger services. Um, uh, there are questions that are on the edge of competition law and regulation. For example, when we talk about interoperability and all these kind of issues, this is something for both sides. But here again, you see how complex this is. So is what we tried in the past is to draw parts of, of the digital economy into existing regulation. But I think here we talk about something else. Um, and again, I come back to what Simeon has said. I couldn't have put it better. At different business cases, there are different strategies and some, a bundle of strategies leads to the foreclosure of a market or to harm of the consumer. So as an agency, whatever you do, whether you are a competition agency or a regulatory body, you have to deal with all of them at the same time. And that does not work without a thorough analysis. So I don't see as how we get around this analysis the only way might be we regulate them all, but that would again mean we regulate companies whom we never ever would see any necessity to regulate them because they are not strong, they have no market power. So this is part of the problem and this is why it is so hard to compare what needs to be done in the future to what we have done in specific industries uh, in the past. Although, I mean, I, I, I mentioned it in, in my remarks uh, with regard to the amendment we are about to see here, uh, here in Germany, we see, or let's put it this way, we, we try to, to give a better definition um, of what kind of companies we are talking about. This is why we have these similar expressions of gatekeepers strategic uh, market status, undertakings with paramount significance for competition across markets. I do not think that varies uh, very much to a certain extent. And uh, to, be, to be frank, we, we all know whom we are talking about here in a way. I could come back now to, Ma to Tommaso Valetti, uh, who always said, well, in fact, I'm only worried about about Google and Facebook, we, are, we, will be, we will be able to deal with the rest with competition law. This is not what I want, this is not my position, uh, but we know about whom we might be talking in the future and what the incumbents are. So I think we have a clear idea whom we could define as such companies and um, we, we, we implement some kinds of behavior which in the future per se are restricted or forbidden for those companies whom we have defined as undertakings with paramount significance for competition across market. Um, we will forbid self-preferencing. That is stated in the law. Uh, we will forbid envelopment strategies. We will forbid establishing entry barriers related uh, to data. So, if you want, this is already a per se definition of a behavior that will be forbidden to certain predefined companies. And that means that our task becomes easier to a certain extent because we do not have to reinvent the theory of harm. The theory of harm is in the law. So there are two parameters in the future that are in, um, in the German law. Which are the companies that are subject to this provision, plus what is the behavior um, that is forbidden in the future. That is already very much per se, that is already pretty prescriptive and has a regulative uh, character in a way. Um, so um, I think we can deal with that and I think uh, we will get along well uh, with, with these kind of, um, well, well-defined parameters 
which are already pretty close to what what maybe is also meant at the European level. Um, uh, we will see. But we will also have to do some fine tuning <laughs> with regard what is self preference. Um, what 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 is uh, what, what is an envelopment strategy? That needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, but again, the law will help a lot if it comes into place this way. Thank, thanks a lot. So I, I, I don't want to keep you uh, here any longer because I know that you have another commitment. So thanks a lot for being with us uh, today and we will keep following closely uh, what is happening uh, in Germany. Thank, thank you, Inge. Thank you for understanding and uh, still a good conference. Excellent uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, let's, so let's continue uh, the discussion with our other two, two panelists. So there's still a question in, um, in the Q&A on uh, the type of regulation. Uh, and and uh, Simeon mentioned that in the UK, part of the actions um, that will, uh, will be implemented is uh, a code of conduct. So can I first go to Alex to see if you have any thoughts on um, uh, what could be sort of the type of action that the DSA should prioritize? We have discussed already um, this trade-off between um, a case-by-case -case analysis uh, with the option of including uh, some practices uh, in, a, in a, a type of blacklist. So how can we make sure that uh, this regulation is effective uh, and, and um, uh, tries to address the main concerns while also leaving scope um, uh, for businesses to actually grow into maybe the next, uh, the next successful company in Europe. So what could be a good regulatory method here? So um, uh, when it comes to a one-size-fits-all um, uh, approach, I think this is one of the most clear points that, that and I think there was common agreement in, in the European Parliament, especially in the Internal Market Committee when we were discussing the salient issues of both the revision of the e-commerce directive and also the um, internal market instrument. Um, there was a common, common understanding, common approach that uh, we should not opt um, for a, for a, for a one-size-fits-all approach because here we are dealing with a very diversified um, sector, different players interacting at different different um, levels. Uh, and also, we are dealing with so many different, different practices. Um, so therefore, we have to uh, adapt also our approach to different scenarios uh, that, 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 that we will have in front of us. When it comes to the issue of uh, a regulatory, so it's, it's, it's useless to have a system uh, written down on paper, which will sound very good, but then when it comes to enforcement, when it comes to seeing that the system basically works in each and every member state, and also at, uh, at EU level, you will not have this, this um, regulatory approach, which uh, will see and oversee all the mechanisms uh, of this of this internal market instrument of this of this of this of this of the DSA approach. So uh, it's it's and this was one of the biggest discussions that we had in the internal market committee to find uh, a way forward for this for this uh, overseeing structure. For the for the for the uh, both for the DSA and also for the internal market instrument, it's what it was one of the biggest questions. But I believe that the elements of cooperation, the elements of enforcement, the element of regulation are um, really important to be working and to be visible uh, at you at you level. Thank you. So uh, then uh, moving to, to Simeon, could you explain a bit more um, on what this code of conduct um, the CMA recommended, what this would entail? Would this be a form of self-regulation, co-regulation, and who would be in charge of, of drafting it? And maybe since we reached the end of the session, uh, maybe you could also um, explain a bit on what would be the concrete next steps that are going to happen in the UK now the market study is done and we can really work towards uh, concrete uh, steps. Very happy to do that. So 
Um, the code we envisage as a statutory code. That means it would need to have an underpinning in legislation. It would it be enforceable in that the authority with the power to enforce the code would have the power to stop decisions, reverse decisions um, of the platform subject to the code. And now we use the term DMU, Digital Markets Unit, to describe that entity, but there are still considerations about where um, that entity should sit. So I think it's very important to say that um, we think the code should be mandatory. A code, the term, tends to mean different things to different people. And I think for some people, they, they hear the word code and they think, oh, it's a voluntary sort of uh, tool. We were very clear, given the entrenched nature of the market power of these platforms, that it had to be mandatory and it had to have strong powers of enforcement. Um, so that's the code. Um, in terms of the next steps, um, we were in the unusual position actually in the market study. We, we published the final report in July and we did the interim report in December. In between those two dates, the government, the UK government announced at budget that it was um, broadly accepting the idea of a, of a um, pro-competition regulatory regime and commissioned the CMA to do further work through a digital markets task force to consider some of these principles in the context of platforms that aren't primarily funded through digital advertising. So for example, Amazon uh, and others. Um, and uh, so that's the work that we are undertaking now. We have said that we will reach conclusions on that work by the end of the year. Our um, hope and expectation is that there will be legislative activity um, quickly following on from those conclusions uh, and that we will have primary legislation to introduce these concepts of the code and the pro-competition interventions and a regulatory authority to implement them. So that's, that's the next plan. The other thing I should say um, in, in our study, we set out that um, we think that these tools are a complement to existing ex post enforcement tools. And we were actively considering um, the case for ex post enforcement in this sector as well. So we are considering the use of our own powers alongside advocating this new regime, which we hope will be put in place on a timely basis. Okay. Thank you. So still a, still a lot of, uh, of work uh, to be done Indeed. and a lot of uh, issues uh, open for discussion after today's uh, session. So we run out of time. So I'm going to close um, uh, the discussion uh, here. So I think we really have seen again today the, the range of different interests involved, which makes this a very interesting, but also a very complex uh, policy area. So we will see uh, how things will evolve the coming months when uh, the plans of the European Commission will uh, become clear. And we will, of course, also keep following uh, the developments at the national level um, that feed into this process. So today we, we discuss this topic from a more substantive perspective. Uh, but what we did not really discuss um, is uh, what could be the institutional framework. So um, who should enforce the rules? How should this uh, be done? And with what competences? And, and these are questions that uh, will be at the heart of uh, our next event, which will take place on Thursday, 29th of October. And uh, there we will also welcome uh, Executive Vice President Vestager of the European Commission who will give a keynote speech. So do already uh, save the date and keep an eye on our website, digitalclearinghouse.org, where you will soon find the program and uh, the link for registration. So, so thanks to, to all of you for, uh, for joining today. A uh, special thank you to, to the panelists for their insightful uh, discussions. And also I would like to thank the team at uh, the European Policy Center who made uh, today's online event uh, possible. So I hope to see you in uh, one of our next events and I wish you a good day. Thank you.